This is Sarp Storefront. The kombucha category grew from $1 million in sales in 2014 to $1.8 billion in 2019. Between being positioned as a better for you soda alternative and the large marketing spend, it's no wonder how kombucha quickly skyrocketed in popularity. But the problem with kombucha is that the flavor is polarizing. For example, Mark Cuban is simply not a fan. To fill this gap, other probiotic drinks fought to capture market share. When today's guest, Rosa Lee, founder of Wild Wonder, appeared on Shark Tank, the big fruit flavors combined with the pre and probiotics packed into a can was a hit. Kombucha skeptic Mark Cuban gulped down his entire can. Wild Wonder is the world's first sparkling prebiotic and probiotic beverage for gut health. It tastes more like a fresh juice than a fermented drink. Today we chat with Rosa about why she left her prestigious finance job to start a consumer packaged good company, the importance of diversifying everything, and how her Shark Tank appearance couldn't have worked out more perfectly. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to the founder of Wild Wonder, Rosa. Thanks for coming on the pod. Thanks for having me, Diego. For people who don't know, what is Wild Wonder? Well, Wild Wonder is a sparkling drink that uh, combines herbal wisdom with whimsical flavors. We're the first drink to combine both prebiotics and probiotics. And we're here today, you're launching a new product and you've given it to us today. And so yeah. Pineapple Paradise, where are you launching it? Give us a little window. Definitely, so Pineapple Paradise, our newest flavor, we just launched online D2C on our website, as well as Amazon, is currently in retail exclusively at Sprouts. For okay. the- at Sprouts. Three months. Okay, yeah. for people listening, so for me, so I'm from Peru. And it reminds me of this drink called uh, Inca Cola, which is like a pineapple oh, fun. soda that they used to have. It was like the best drink ever in Peru. And then Coca-Cola would go on to acquire them. But it's like the drink of Peru. And so if you happen to be Peruvian or know this drink, this, <laughs> this will give you a, this is a much healthier version. Though. That's great. So I will say that's that. what we strive to do is healthier <laughs> version of something nostalgic. Yes. The nostalgia. That's what I was. Yeah. It brings me back. So let's yeah. go to the beginning. What made you want to start this company? My grandparents raised me for the first 12 years of my life in China while my parents immigrated to the States. Grandma brewed these healing tonics with a symphony of wild herbs and botanicals that were really good for my health. So she really taught me the philosophy of food as medicine from an early age. And I started my career in finance, so investment banking, and then went on to private equity and venture investing. Uh, what did you learn? Let's go back. Every, everybody that I know that seems to be successful at some point, investment banking like bro <laughs> breaks them or something. Like something happens. What, do you, what, what things did you learn during your investment banking private equity days that really sort of resonate today. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would stay in the office till like 2 or 3 a.m. Yeah, you're working your... Constantly. Yeah. And, um, you know, both days on the weekends, I, you know, evenings and just nonstop. And I would travel a lot. So at one point, I actually went to my doctor during my annual checkup. And he said to me, wow, you're the first girl who overreported her weight by 15 pounds. And that really shocked me. And I was like, wow, I didn't realize I was losing weight and um, I wasn't sleeping well. So started really reading more about gut health. I definitely had um, some health issues that stemmed in my gut and um, actually learned more about gut health and just overall wellness and got my microbiome tested, um, really became a true believer in gut health. And I also went back to grandma's herbal tonics and this whole Eastern herbal philosophy. And after business school, I decided to just do something I'm personally passionate about. And that's really turning herbal wisdom and heritage inspired and gut healthy ingredients to something that's very delicious and accessible. Was there something during the business school days, like for me, when I went to business school, every class at some point, you have to do some presentation, something, right? So I was like, analyze this company or do this thing. And so what I would do is when I was in business school, I was like, I'm not, I'm done with the, the, the days of let's take a hypothetical company or a yeah. company let's take Disney from the 90s and let's analyze them and then let's pretend to tell them what to do. Like I was done with it. And so what I would do is I, I was in Boston, so I would just go to a Boston company and I would say, hey guys, it's a bunch of MBA students. We have to do an analysis. Can we do it on your firm in real time? Same exact concept, but then present it to you. And luckily I got my team to agree. And so we always made like real world presentations. It was never some fake thing. Cause I, that's how I operate. Like it yeah. bothers me to do all this energy mm -hmm. for this hypothetical situation that doesn't exist with a known solution that bothered me. That's not why I'm going to business school. And so w when you were in business school, did you ever think like, okay, like did this company come about through some things in business school? Good question. So I actually didn't start this business in business school. Um, during business school, I was very focused on 
learning about startups because so when I was doing investing, I started in private equity. So it's a late stage, um, okay. and then like like BC stage. Um, so I started. I mean, my portfolio companies range from the pre-revenue stage all the way to Fortune 500. So okay. when I was in New York, my started my career at Warburg Pincus and uh, focused on very late stage businesses, definitely post revenue. Sure. Um, and okay. then when came out here to San Francisco and focused on early stage pre-revenue companies. So was fascinated by growth stage and was fascinated by startups, but I didn't have any operating experience. I was overseeing portfolio companies as an investor and I was very well versed on the investing side. So in business school, I was very focused on learning about startups and actually um, doing something more hands-on. So I literally volunteered at all these startups um, during school and basically helped them with whatever they want, they need help with. Oh, so cool. I kind of, I would just work my way. I worked part-time, essentially offer free labor yeah, that's <laughs> um, awesome. and learn a ton about e-commerce startups and worked in marketing. And after business wash, I helped a friend launch a business in Asia. So basically got my hands dirty with consumer product startups and then decided that I personally want to do something I'm passionate about. What were and you seeing with these companies? Like, what was the thing that most of these companies kept messing up? Well, you know, I'm very data driven, and you know, especially coming from finance, um, I, what I realize is a lot of startups because everything's so busy, is running at such fast pace. Most people aren't looking at the data. So, what my value add was really analyzing everything at a higher level and turning data into strategy. People simply just didn't have the time to look at data, and now. I'm running my own startup and I can see how important data is. And a lot of people still still aren't looking at data because, you know, we can get weekly, monthly retail data and figure out, okay, are we doing the right thing in retail? Do we have the right promo strategy, pricing strategy, um, yeah. you know, executions? Yeah. I think the thing I see a lot is I think talent blinds you. And so you can mm -hmm. meet a really talented founder who has found market product fit mm -hmm. and is seemingly doing some things right, but they don't know why. And they don't care to know why. And, well, no, if you're and no one well, on their team is like digging into the data. Yeah. And it's the one thing that can, it's great for a little while, but right. you have to get really sophisticated at some point Definitely. in order to get to that, to ascend. Otherwise yeah. that talent will run out. Yeah. And then especially if you're doing well, you actually don't see a lot of problems because right. you're doing well exactly. and you're not really analyzing every aspect of your business. That's why I love these downturns in the economy. <laughs> That's and right. COVID. It makes things simple. <laughs> All right, so so you launched this company what year? We actually launched Wild Wonder literally uh, the first year of COVID. So Perfect. 2020, timing. So great good. timing on my part. <laughs> everyone's, well, in some ways it was. Like everyone's worried about their health and everyone's in the grocery store. Well, Maybe. at the beginning, they weren't. So, <laughs> okay. you know, if you think about the beverage, it's grab and go. So this moves the fastest when you're out and about. And so when people are at a cafe, when people are at a restaurant, when they're in a park and they grab a can, 2020, the entire world shut down. So... No one was going out, so the the beverage category actually dropped significantly because people weren't shopping, they weren't out and about. So it was actually very hard. And on top of that, my my launch and distribution strategy was food service. So the health conscious offices, cafes. Um, so I had large POs going out to these offices that got completely wiped out. Uh, I think you COVID mentioned that hit. on Shark Tank, right? You, you were at Facebook, had a big PO. Yeah. And then I, that got yeah, shut down. Yep. And we were, we had relationships with a lot of these offices that large POs, um, I was super excited to launch because that's a great channel for brand awareness, for product trial. And all of a sudden that entire business, I mean, that was 100% of my strategy and that got okay. wiped out. So okay. it felt like I had to really restart and we did. So we basically build our Shopify site, you know, within the first three months. I actually didn't want to do online because it's a beverage who wants to ship liquid across the U.S. Yeah. It's very heavy, but I would say COVID actually impacted us in a way. I mean, it was really hard short term, but in the long run, it was very good because it really accelerated the growth of our channel strategy. Yeah. So, How long did it take you to figure out that pivot? Was it almost immediate because everything shut down anyway? And so there's a yeah, part of you that just Yeah, I had to figure goes, out cash flow. So yeah, we and had you're, costs. You're in existing inventory. You're sitting on all this inventory. Yeah. So you got to move it. Definitely. It was, Does this have to be refrigerated or, is it, or can it be at room temperature? Yeah. So it's a refrigerated product. And, and here's why. We, we're the first can and product to put both prebiotic and probiotic in the same can. So I don't know if you know much about gut health, but prebiotics. Tell the world. Tell yeah, them. <laughs> prebiotics is a food for probiotics to thrive. So without prebiotics... 
all the healthy gut bacteria actually don't function as effectively. So a lot of people have been, you know, looking into fermented foods, kombucha, drinking vinegar, all the probiotics, they're great for you, you know, don't stop taking them. But just like humans, we function better when there's food in their system. So prebiotics nourish the probiotics. So they actually interact and we need to keep everything, you know, the functional benefits more sustained and keep everything stable in the same can. Okay. Going back to the business. So what was the first step once you realized this retail, I guess you had, you had to change. So what happened? Yeah, we had to pivot really fast. There's kind of like a bomb ticking. (laughs) And I immediately started building our Shopify site. So the idea is look at all these relationships that we had in food service. So how do I turn that into revenue? It's very much focused on cash flow. So I basically built our Shopify site within three months and started taking care of our office food service customers in the comfort of their homes. So we would turn those revenues, ship products directly to people, but I would still contract with the companies and say, hey, let me ship these care packages. Through you, yeah. Yeah, to to your employees. Really smart, Um, well done. I like that, pivot a lot, smart. Yeah, Yeah. so first year was a lot of online revenue and all organic too, because we didn't do any paid marketing. And and I know a lot of people's sales just skyrocketed when they had Shopify, but I didn't have Shopify prepared at the time, but we were able to build it within three months and started generating revenue within three months. At the same time, I was going out into the field and literally visiting every single grocery store possible that's around the San Francisco Bay Area. So while everyone's quarantining at home, I was driving in my car and knocking on doors and helping the grocery store managers stock their shelves while I was introducing our products. So by the end of... So like real boots on the ground. You're really going into it. You're probably wearing a hazmat suit. Um, it's getting crazy. I, I was wearing double masks and, <laughs> uh, and it was definitely high risk, but I had to survive. So I visited something like over 200 stores within the first three months and all the independents. And by the end of year one, so that was 2020, we were in over 100 stores, including our local Whole Foods. Wow. Molly Stones? Molly Stones, nice. Lunardi's, um, all the independents. Northern California is blessed with a lot of independence, similar to, you know, SoCal. So, you know, all the corner stores had our products. And are you still trying to figure out at this time, so you're getting into the stores, but is your mind going, obviously the D2C is, is way higher in terms of valuation. So is, is a part of your brain going, if I go direct to consumer, are you still pursuing the direct to consumer route or are you just now going pure CPG? So, yeah, good question. So if I learn anything about co- from COVID, it's diversify. So diversify everything from our suppliers to our co-packers to our distribution channel. So we actually have a very diversified channel strategy since the beginning, since COVID. So, um, you know, a part of our business is in food service and that continues to be a big part and a part of our business is in retail and a part of it is online. Online is divided between Amazon and D2C. So everything is intentional. It just it didn't just happen this way. We're very intentional about investing in these multiple channels and have that omni-channel strategy. The idea is really to touch the same customer throughout their day from when, you know, you're shopping online, you're browsing on uh, Facebook, Instagram, to when you're shopping in the grocery store, to when you're working in the office, having lunch in the cafe. So more impressions, more uh, brand awareness, more product trial. Hard to do, but really smart. And I see how COVID did that. It's intelligent. At what point do you start thinking, maybe I go on Shark Tank? Did, Did they approach you? How did that happen? Yeah, so they they reached out to me. Um, They actually reached out to me at the beginning of COVID. I believe it was 2021, maybe. I can't remember exactly when, but at the time I was literally just in survival mode and I was like, we weren't ready for this. I'm not going to do Shark Tank because we're, first of all, during COVID, our coal packer actually shut down. So we were out of inventory for a few months because we couldn't produce. So like there's just so much going on at the time. I didn't think that we would be able to afford uh, national TV uh, exposure. Got so it, you know what it would mean if it did air. Yeah. Yeah. Understood. And okay. I kind of knew, but I didn't quite know until I, it aired. And I was like, wow, this is so impactful. But fast forward 2022, I can't even keep track of everything now. It's like a blur to think about. Yeah. The last I, three years. Yeah. But basically last year we were in a kind of the right stage okay. for more exposure. We, okay. we hadn't invested that much in marketing. We started building up 
infrastructure to scale. And then I also had multiple co-packers that can scale us. And then we've iterated the product so much that the velocity started to prove itself in retail. So I said, okay, great repeat purchase, great product, great shelf presence from the packaging, and really good velocity. So you felt so ready, mentally ready. I, like you had I a good felt product, ready. I felt like this is the right time to step on the gas pedal and put some marketing behind it. So then I responded back to the very initial email that they sent me, and I said, I know this is like a whole year late, <laughs> but you know we're interested. Let me know what to do. And then we started to go through the entire application process, which I'm sure you've heard multiple times from yeah. brands that you talk to. And we had Mind- we had Mindy on, who I'm sure you've met yeah. from casting, mm-hmm. and she told us the whole the whole process. But yeah, okay, so then so we we um, we taped last September and we aired initially in January, and we had a recent re-air as well. So that was massive impact. Before you get on the show, you personally, are you are you doing your due diligence on like which one of them has invested in CPG? Are you targeting a certain shark? Who did you ultimately want to get a deal with? Obviously, we'll talk about the rest of it, but yeah. before the show, like who were you t- really trying to get? Yeah, so I didn't find out about my shark panel until I want to say it's one or two weeks before taping. So they wouldn't tell you anything. On, so you knew, you knew Tony was going to be on it? I did not know until like a week before. Okay. So obviously, you know, like Shark Tank, they try to match you with the best the best fit. And they said, okay, there's going to be a judge I think would be perfect for you. He's in food tech, not food. And actually, when they said this, I was like, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if it's something like DoorDash? Because then I could be on DoorDash. Yeah. But that was such a random thought. That's I just kind of thought, thought to that. myself, <laughs> you know, that would be so funny. And then they told me Tony Shu DoorDash. I was like, oh my gosh. Like that would be yeah. a dream. So as you're going into the show though, are you thinking, all right, Tony's obvious that you it's probably on your kill list. Who else? <laughs> Who else is on that list? Is, Tony's the only one on the list. Tony's the only one. I I okay. definitely went after him. I actually didn't want anyone else. I mean, I fully respect all the sharks. I just thought Tony would actually bring in such good value for us from a distribution perspective. What I love about this conversation that we have, we have on the podcast is the more companies that we talk to yeah. that have been on the show, um, the more I realize like it's actually kind of the entrepreneur that has the upper hand. And I don't think they know that. Like all the entrepreneurs I've spoken to that have sat in your chair, mm-hmm. what's cool about it is they've all done the research and they all have a shark that they want, which means they have five or four sharks they don't want. Mm-hmm. And it's a really interesting thing to think about because I think most people from the outside, when you're watching the show as a viewer, yeah. You're thinking like, wow, this entrepreneur is, <laughs> they just want to take any deal, you know? But that's right. not true. Like you guys are sophisticated enough to know like the power dynamic. It's kind of the reverse of what most people think. And that's something that I love about these conversations, Yeah, which is pretty cool. All right. So you get on, they try it. They immediately start bashing you because of CPG. They're all scarred from CPG. <laughs> Sounds all, like you watched the oh, episode. You got to watch it. <laughs> For people who haven't, please go. You can YouTube it. It's on your website, I think, too. It's not on our website, but if you YouTube it, there's plenty of plenty. people who have shared it. Yeah. yeah. But the th- like, what I liked about it is I invest in CPG. So obviously, yeah. I, I, there's a part of me that understands the tremendous Mount Everest that you guys are about to go through and the amount of capital required to yeah. make this successful for me as an investor and for you as a founder and some luck along the way. And so they're all like sort of scarred from this, like Mr. Wonderful. Oh, all I them. knew going in that they were not going to like beverage. There's a specific <laughs> thing okay. everyone talks about. The minute you bring a beverage on the show, everyone hates on beverage distribution. That was expected. I mean, I hate on beverage distribution. And it's not easy. So that's why I was really going for Tony because he could actually bring additional distribution for us. My goal for the show was not to get a deal from everyone. My goal was to have everyone like the product. Okay. So that was really... Which seemed like that happened, by the way. It seemed it like did. that... And Mark Cuban chucked an entire can of strawberry and he said, I just drank this whole thing. I really like it. I'm going to order it. I hate kombucha. <laughs> and this tastes so much better. And everyone loved the drinks, loved the taste, which is... That's my f- first priority. Yeah. My second priority was to, okay, actually lock in a deal with Tony. Yep. And so you go there, I think, what was the ask? You, you were trying to get 500000 for 5%? Y- yeah. Something I like mean, that. something like that. It's been so long. <laughs> yeah. And so then I think you guys end up at 500 for nine, but three of it's like advisor shares. Yeah. I negotiate something. I didn't want the valuation to really affect our internal valuation because we had also other deals with other investors. Sure, sure. Um, there's only so much I can do there. So I essentially offered something that would give him what he wanted, but also 
doesn't hurt our valuation and what so much. Did, what, what year was that? Or what day? Do you remember the day this that, that was, was happening? Um, this was September last year. Of 2022. Yeah. And so still a weird time in terms of investment, still a weird time in terms of the economy, a lot mm-hmm. of uncertainty. And so in some way, this is like perfect timing for you, for a company in your position. It, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it was more importantly, it was perfect timing because of where in the process of scaling. So this was great, you know, marketing, great brand awareness. Uh, obviously the cash helps, but you know, I would say we weren't desperate for, for cash. Sure. We had, I mean, we had cash flow from business. We also have outside investors. Yeah. So I didn't care as much about the money, but I cared more about the value they could bring. So you and Tony on there, you make a deal and then does the deal go through? Did you guys end up completing it? Yeah. So he actually okay. um, is, Truly an investor and advisor to the business. That's amazing. Yeah, and we're what very is, excited. What happened? Did anything unique happen as it relates to DoorDash specifically? Yeah, so we're actually in talks with DoorDash where the goal is for us to be on DoorDash's platform. So they're helping us to gain more distribution. And imagine you order your lunch from a restaurant on DoorDash and you pull up the menu. There's very limited beverages. There's a water, there's a Coke. Uh, and then there's really nothing else. So there's over a million restaurants on DoorDash platform. And think about Wild Wonder being the only the non-Coke only beverage. water beverage on there. And that's hugely impactful. And that's what we're working towards. And obviously, I'm not going to do a million restaurants all of a sudden. And we can't do that. But we'll start region by region. And there's a lot of other platforms within the DoorDash platform that will be really helpful for us as well. And that's something that Tony actually pitched to us on TV. You didn't see this part because that's edited out. But when we're talking, I was in there for over an hour and I was actually asking him, okay, what kind of value can DoorDash bring to Wild Wonder? And there's so many. You're interviewing him. Well, if I'm giving him equity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) I want to know what I'm getting him to. So good. That's awesome. And yeah, so he shared a lot about what they can do and connected me with different people at DoorDash as well. And what are the other sharks? Are they saying anything? Are they trying to get, are they trying to like, keep the conversation to them, what's happening on the other side. I think sharks. at that point, I was really just, I mean, you can tell I was really going after Tony. And they were all listening to, you know, how DoorDash can help Wild Wonder grow. And give people a window into, so then you air, you said January? January, okay. earlier this year. Yeah. Okay, so earlier this year, Q1. And then what, what happens to the company? What do you see? How do the velocities go? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, there's kind of the, uh, immediate impact to sales. And then there's more importantly, the long-term impact. So, I mean, we had such huge sales over the weekend. I can't remember the exact number numbers, but it's, we had 150,000 visits to our website all of a sudden. Wow. And I know that people were looking for the products. We have a store locator. So I know people were looking for products in stores near them. So they would like type in their zip code, you know, address to see if it's their Sprouts, is there Whole Foods. There's 30 to 50,000 searches on our store locator. And I know that's a big range, but we had some like really large numbers. And I remember thinking at the time, this is so impactful. We were out of inventory on Amazon within a few hours. So when East Coast aired, that was, you know, 5 p.m. Pacific time. We immediately went out of inventory. So then we had this huge influx of people coming to our website and huge boost to our online sales. And I think we made a whole year's worth of online sales in one month. Yeah. It's very impactful. That's crazy. But what's really impactful is really the long-term growth. Okay. Right? So Shark Tank, the way I think about it is really catapulted us to a different level. We've iterated our product so much that now it's really ready to scale. And it didn't just, you know, our sales didn't just peak and then come down. It really elevated our baseline. So we've like quadrupled our monthly sales at the beginning of the year. And we, every month it just continues to increase. Wow. Um, so it didn't actually come down. That's amazing. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. In, in relation to like, did you raise capital after it aired? Were you in the process of raising? Um, I didn't okay raise. We weren't worried about money at the time. I would say yeah. the main thing <laughs> yeah. was inventory actually scaling up inventory sure. because if you have that much sales we like scaled up our production capacity like 4x like immediately and that's not easy to do so we were just very much focused on let's make sure we have products let's make sure we don't go out of stock let's service every single customer and make sure everyone has product so it's all about 
distribution at that time. Yeah. And how's that going? You figured it out? It's going well. You have a, do you have a new, dis, a new area, a new, a new like location where you're canning and doing all this? Well, we have a very one, good partner, um, okay. our co-packer. Like I mentioned earlier, we're, we're very diversified in everything. We have multiple co-packers um, that we work with. We have multiple suppliers. Even still. For every ingredient. You're hedging. You're always hedging. Always hedging. My investor hat on is like, you always want to mitigate risk. Even when you don't think there's risk, preempt every problem. So we continue to diversify everything. That's the job of an entrepreneur. That's the whole job. <laughs> risk mitigation. Yeah, yeah. So um, we're good on the, we're very happy that we actually didn't go out of inventory, didn't go out of stock. We have inventory and we continue to grow our inventory and grow our operations. I want to give people a window into what you're talking about. So there was a, we had a, I forget what company came on here, but basically they make like a, gr- a gluten-free product and they're working with one farm and something happened where the wind blew the wrong way and the, <laughs> all of a sudden this product was no longer gluten-free. And because they were only sourcing from this one farm, they had to effectively discontinue all of their products wow. for a small amount of time. Obviously this is a huge issue to a business. And so your point around diversification, case in point, yeah, right? That's why yeah. maybe working with a you couple never of know. people. And like you never know. And like one co-power can catch fire. You never know. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So what's next for the company? What are you, what are you, what's your, what's, what are you working on now? Obviously you've mentioned this flavor before, but is there. Yeah. Yeah. The we, plans? I mean, I would say it's product innovation. We're constantly innovating and we just launched this pineapple paradise flavor. Um, we're already working on a new flavor for next year. And most of the excitement comes from distribution and expansion. So when I first started, we've always had a strategy to go deep, not wide, to really penetrate every region we're in. So when I first started back in 2020, I was only focused on NorCal. We launched Southern California at the beginning of, beginning of 2022, and now it's our largest region. We're now stocked at Whole Foods, you know, Sprouts here, or Sprouts nationally, but also Target, a lot of these really awesome retailers that like Irwan, Bristol Farms, everything that you can probably think of around here. Now we are ready to scale more, I would say, to the East Coast, to the Midwest. So from a distribution perspective, we have some massive expansions coming up uh, in the summertime that we're really excited about. We're also launching in different regions. So one of the things we learned from Shark Tank was the Midwest is actually a really great geography to expand to. Um, my parents live in the Midwest. Where specifically? They live in Indiana. So, okay. you know, you how do you think get the about, Indiana? That's the whole goal of the startup. I, I've been asked. How do you get, how do you get, how do you get the Indiana? If you get Indiana, you win. I know. I mean, it's funny because a lot of innovation starts from the coastal regions, right? You know, See, I say SF, this, people think I'm LA, joking, but it's like, I'm being serious. Like if you figure out Indiana, <laughs> I think you've done it. Well, so we, last year at the end of the year, very end of the year, I launched at Fresh Time, which is an awesome natural retailer in the Midwest. And all of a sudden, my parents realized I was doing something with my life. And that it was- They're finally they're, proud of you? <laughs> well, they didn't know. They were like a little <laughs> confused why I quit finance. And I think this really brought it home. Once they see something on store shelves that they can actually shop at, then it becomes more tangible. And obviously, they were super excited to see me on TV when we aired on Shark Tank. Sure. But once we expand more to the Midwest, and I think that really proves the thesis that we had in the beginning, because we're here to expand the market for kombucha with no fermented taste, right? It's gut health beverage. Most of those have an acquired taste. You think about the kombuchas, drinking vinegars of the world. And we actually offer the same benefits with very approachable taste profiles. So we're here to really serve the more average consumer who's not necessarily shopping at a health food store. Sure. You know, so what's the price point for people listening? 3.49. All right. So it's competitive to, you know, kombuchas and other functional sure. beverages. Yeah. And I have to ask, how's grandma? Grandma's is she, great. Is she on She's the board in China. of advisors? She, <laughs> well, she is inspiration I mean, for the brand. And Does she um, have a favorite? Does she have a favorite here? You know, she hasn't tasted everything, but oh, she no. did say my drinks taste way better than the herbal tonics that she used to brew. So <laughs> okay. uh, mission accomplished. I love it. Well, look, thanks for coming on the podcast and sharing your story. Thank I you appreciate it. Me. I'm glad grandma's happy. And uh, thank you. Good luck. Thank you. If you made it this far, I bet you loved the episode. So you should join our YouTube channel membership for only $2.99 a month. This gets you access to one, the whole unabridged conversation. Two, you get the episodes on Monday, one day earlier. Three, you get two additional entries to our giveaways. Check out our Instagram to see what we've given away. And four, you get access to seasons one through three. That's over 100 episodes of wisdom and life-changing advice. What are you waiting for? Join.